Okay, live stream is up. PC recording done. Cloud recording done. Back up is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Martinez with your opening statement, please. Good, more, good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. Uh, to minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I am City Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology, and I want to welcome you all to our hearing today. It's a beautiful day in New York City. Uh, in today's world, broadband is essential for everything from finding a job to connecting with friends and families and even receiving medical care. Unfortunately, this essential service is not available to all New Yorkers. Accessibility and affordability are common factors for the lack of internet access. Often, even if the broadband infrastructure is available, it is not always affordable for a large number of New York City residents. In January of 2020, the Office of New York City Chief Technology Officer issued the New York City Internet Master Plan calling it the most ambitious plan for citywide broadband in the nation, which will spur better service at lower costs, close the digital divide, and bring universal broadband to the homes and fingertips of all New Yorkers. Today, we will discuss the deadlines, progress, obstacles, and steps to achieve this inspiring goal. I want to thank all of our witnesses for taking their time today to discuss this important topic and their willingness to find solutions to this important issue. Uh, we have spent much time in this committee over the last year discussing the digital divide in New York City and how it affects our economy and society in general. In October 2020, we had a joint hearing with the Land Use Committee on Broadband and the Digital Divide. In January, we had a joint hearing with the Aging Committee on Increasing Senior Access to Technology also relevant to this issue. Uh, during these hearings, we learned about several efforts that the administration took to close the gap in broadband coverage and access, including the recent announcement by the mayor committing $157 million in capital investment for the Internet Master Plan, which with the launch of universal solicitation for broadband citywide request for proposals RFP. New York City Internet Master Plan has terrific goals with the main one being to get all New Yorkers connected and online, and we hope to see the results soon. This hearing will be a valuable step to clarifying how we can work together and speed up the implementation of the Internet Master Plan and close the digital divide. Um, I, we look forward to hearing testimony from the administration, experts, and community advocates on this important, important issue. I'd like to recognize the following city council members who have joined us today, uh, Councilman Yeager and Council Member Lander. Um, I would also like to thank our wonderful technology uh, committee staff, Council Irene Vahovsky, poly policy analyst Charles Kim, and finance analyst Florentine Kabor uh, for their terrific work on this hearing. Also, my staff, I'd like to thank them, Chief, uh, Chief of Staff Daniel Kurzina, Communications Director Kevin Ryan, and Legislative Director Craig Caruana. I will now turn it over to the Committee Council, Irene Vahovsky, to go over some procedural items. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Holden. I'm Irene Vahovsky the Council to the Committee on Technology, and I will be moderating this hearing today. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify. After you called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called as I announce the panelists. 
we will be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. All public testimony will be limited to five minutes as well. After I call your name, please wait for a brief moment for a surgeon at arm to announce that you might begin before starting your testimony. Now, I will call the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from New York City Chief Technology Officer, John Paul Farmer. And at this time, I would like to administer the affirmation. Mr. Farmer, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Farmer. You might begin when ready. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Holden and committee members. As you know, I'm John Paul Farmer, the Chief Technology Officer of the City of New York, and I'm glad to be back here with you today. I will discuss the NYC Internet Master Plan, the city's plan to realize the mayor's commitment to universal broadband for all New Yorkers. The master plan is the most comprehensive approach of any city in the country to end the digital divide, reverse digital redlining and racial inequity, and ensure that the implementation of new technologies don't follow the historic patterns of inequity, but indeed benefit everyone. The internet master plan is at its core, a 4G and 5G technology plan, also an economic development plan and a digital equity plan. As you're aware, in January of 2020, the city released the NYC Internet Master Plan, uh, this comprehensive, bold, forward-thinking approach, uh, and it's one that's been praised by our colleagues in other cities around the country. The master plan will transform the inequitable system that has for too long resulted in digital redlining. Instead, it will shift the market by opening up new access to infrastructure to companies large and small who want to help the city meet its affordability, performance, and equity goals. The master plan reflects this administration's years of work on demonstration projects, research and reports, standards and policy setting, and engagement with a wide array of stakeholders. And that includes community organizations, small internet service providers, and large incumbent companies. The mayor's internet master plan has been praised by the country's leading broadband experts. It's been called innovative, a game changer, and quote, the most thoughtful and comprehensive blueprint by any major city. The mayor put the master plan on path to realize the city's goals by making the single largest municipal investment in broadband in American history, $157 million in capital funds. Through the development of the NYC Internet Master Plan, the city identified a primary challenge. The current oligopolistic system is broken and it has built digital inequity into the streets and neighborhoods of New York. Historically, companies alone determined where technology would be deployed and who would have access, often based on strategies of exclusionary pricing. For decades, the city tried that approach but it failed the 3.4 million New Yorkers who are underconnected or fully disconnected. The internet master plan shows the data that 40% of NYC households are without home and mobile connections and an astounding 18% have neither. Due to decades of physically deploying technology through an approach that unfortunately failed so many New Yorkers, reversing digital inequity requires changing the way we build and deploy technology. The households without home and mobile connections are disproportionately in majority minority neighborhoods with high rates of poverty. These are the same neighborhoods with gaps in infrastructure as identified in the master plan. The city's solution to this challenge is to take a new approach, investing in infrastructure to reverse the built inequity, opening up the market to competition and engaging companies in reaching the city's universal broadband goals. And the city's gonna achieve this by one partnering to build or acquire new infrastructure in areas of lowest competition and lowest connectivity. Uh, two, leverage 100,000 public real estate assets, publicly controlled real estate assets to expand 4G and 5G networks equitably. And three, enable service delivery that meets the city's broadband principles. This approach will generate an increase in $142 billion in gross city product 
165,000 jobs for the city, much needed for economic recovery and to remain a competitive city over the coming decades uh, between now and 2045. Since I testified on the city's universal broadband work in October of 2020, the city has advanced its implementation of the NYC Internet Master Plan. I'm pleased to share that last month, the city released its universal solicitation for broadband request for proposals, the RFP. This RFP invites companies large and small and anyone to propose solutions to address the current inequitable system that is described in the Internet Master Plan. Specifically, the city is seeking proposals for three things. Number one, new broadband infrastructure, such as fiber or conduit. Number two, asset managers to make that infrastructure broadly available. And number three, new affordable internet service options that meet the city's principles. We received significant interest at the pre-proposal conference. More than 200 participants participated. And we're looking forward to receiving proposals at the end of this month. In May, the city will review these proposals, begin negotiations, and proceed with the process of licensing city assets, those 100,000 city controlled assets that I mentioned earlier. The mayor's office of the CTO has created a digital tool that will help the RFP review committee visualize and fully understand the geographic and neighborhood impacts of the proposals and how they would work together and complement one another. Those will support the review committee's analysis and decision making. The 18 agencies that have contributed their assets to this endeavor are key partners in making the Internet Master Plan launch and implementation a success. It is the contribution of their rooftops, street furniture, spaces and buildings and more that will allow the city to offer a first ever coordinated point of entry for multi-agency assets and increase the city's ability to set higher standards of quality in exchange for the use of those assets. The RFP allows the city to seek partners who will meet the city's broadband principles that set high standards for equity, affordability, choice, privacy, and performance. This is instead of negotiating one-off ad hoc deals or having multiple standards for multiple different providers. This new system allows the city to realize the value of its assets and ensure that the use brings significant benefit to New Yorkers. The city has also prioritized working with minority and women-owned businesses, MWBEs, as part of this RFP. Since the fall 2020 hearing, the federal government's new leadership has also shifted its approach and the city finds itself with new opportunities related to broadband relief during the pandemic. The congressional stimulus bill passed in early 2021 provided $3.2 billion for the Federal Communications Commission's new Emergency Broadband Benefits Program. This program will offer low-income New Yorkers the opportunity to access subsidies for high-cost broadband that has been essential for their health and safety during the COVID-19 state of emergency. Eligible households would receive $50 per month toward broadband service and a one-time discount of up to $100 for the purchase of a device. The mayor's office of the chief technology officer is in communication with other city agencies to coordinate and maximize benefits of this new program for vulnerable New Yorkers. Congress has recognized connectivity as a key issue for economic recovery, and it's now considering additional legislation, the American Jobs Plan, that would provide nearly $100 billion in funding for broadband. We hope that this is the beginning of new opportunities on the federal level that will support and complement the city's leadership on broadband equity. As we near the selection of proposals solicited by the RFP, the city recognizes the importance of engaging with partners and stakeholders. Organizations offering digital inclusion resources, health, education, workforce, and other community-based organizations and financial institutions, they will be essential partners in ensuring that New Yorkers with new affordable internet service have the skills and tools to safely access online resources so that they can meet their goals and realize their dreams in our shared city. In closing, I'm pleased to report that the city is on the cusp of bold, much needed changes in how we do business and what we expect of companies engaging in our broadband goals in broadening who it is we work with and what types of companies can work with us and in the quality of internet service options available to residents. 2021 is shaping up to be a landmark year of real transformative progress. Thank you for your attention to this matter. I look forward to your questions on this topic. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. I will now turn over to the chair for questions. 
Thank you. Before I begin uh, some questioning, I, I, we've been joined by Council Member Eric Ulrich. Um, thank you for your testimony, uh, John Paul uh, Farmer. You uh, laid out uh, quite quite uh, some very important goals. Uh, and I just, according to the master plan, expanding internet access will create 165,000 new jobs and up to $49 billion increase in personal income and up to $142 billion in incremental gross city product by 2045. Uh, how, how did you arrive at these numbers? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Holden. It's an important question. Looking at um, uh, the economic impact was one of the critical tasks for the interim master plan to do, uh, to understand uh, the ROI, because ultimately these are substantial investments that we're asking the cities to make and uh, the city needs to understand what the benefits uh, can be. So these were developed uh, with expert consultants, um, uh, HRNA being uh, one of the primary uh, drivers of the research behind this report, working on uh, looking at the New York City market as well as the impacts in other markets and assessing, closing that digital divide, those 3.4 million New Yorkers who are disconnected or underconnected uh, and looking at what that, what that means for economic productivity, uh, looking at the impact on small businesses and how much more they're gonna be able to better, they're gonna be able to compete in an increasingly global marketplace. This research was done before the pandemic hit. I would suggest that now it's even more essential and the incremental impact and difference would likely be even higher because you're looking at mom and pop businesses that now have to compete with Amazon. Uh, these uh, uh, changes that we've seen of uh, people ordering things in because it, at the time it was the safer thing to do during the pandemic, um, some of these behaviors are gonna persist. So we need to make sure that all of our businesses here in New York City have uh, the baseline, high quality, high speed, uh, uh, affordable internet that they need uh, to compete. So that's just for the small businesses. And then you look at the reskilling that needs to happen uh, for so many members of our community. Uh, we need to make sure people have internet access so they can get training, get new skills, so they can access jobs. Even applying for a job often requires uh, being on a computer and sometimes a smartphone it won't do it. So those are some of the things that we're looking at in terms of how this was uh, arrived at. Um, uh, this was a Remy analysis, which is commonly used uh, uh, in this space. And um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think what else I can give you in terms of specifics there. Is there anything else that you'd, you'd like well, to like, hear? Like about? other cities have obviously um, uh, have an elder, you know, around the, around the world have universal broadband and public, you know, municipal broadband. And, you know, I mean, you can compare their numbers. I mean, that, that that's what I was yeah. hoping to hear that it is, was there a cost analysis and um, the benefit analysis of, of other you know, uh, cities around the world? Yeah, there absolutely was. When you look at, for instance, a number of European cities, places like Stockholm, Sweden, where they have a neutral host open access fiber network citywide. Um, that is what we are uh, looking to build here. Uh, that'll happen over time. That's not going to happen just this year. And that's why the numbers that were provided in the Internet Master Plan are looking out to 2045, not simply this year, next year, the year after, because this is an iterative process to actually fully close the digital divide and realize all of these benefits. Yeah, 2045, that's a yeah. long way away. But... And one of the, I'll, I'll just add that one of the, one of the challenges with, with uh, these estimates is that other American cities don't have what we're talking about. Um, so here in the United States, where we've got a certain set of rules from the federal government, from the FCC, um, nobody has what we're describing. So we're not simply following somebody else's path. We're, we're blazing a new path. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're getting interest from others. We're looking actually to learn from what we're doing here in New York and, and follow this path too. Okay. We were looking at the, um, the master plan and the words homeless or shelter does not appear on the internet master plan. So how many shelters are equipped with internet access and how long until all sheltered homeless have internet access in your estimation? Uh, that's a very good question, council member, um, Chair Holden. We, yeah, we did hear that from, I'm sorry to interrupt, but sure. we did hear that from a lot of uh, people in shelters that, and you know, I was on the uh, uh, general welfare committee that a lot of the students couldn't, couldn't uh, do remote learning. Who were in shelters, so that that was a, a concern. So that 
it's a very, very important question is how, how fast we can get them on, on the internet. Uh, good question. And that's a, a, a group that is a priority. Uh, we know we need to serve the folks who are most vulnerable, the folks who are least connected and, and least able to afford it. Uh, and that especially relates to, to families living in shelters. That's one of the reasons that the mayor made a commitment a number of months ago um, to, uh, to wire family shelters in particular, to start there. Um, I believe that the RFP that went out last month specifically asks for proposals that uh, address the needs of DSS and HRA shelters. So we are, we are optimistic and hopeful that in these coming weeks, as we receive the proposals back, uh, that those plans, those proposals will include uh, how to serve uh, those living in shelters. Um, yeah, just back in July of 2020, the mayor said $87 million previously allocated to the NYPD and an additional 70 million will provide broadband, broadband internet to, you know, for 200,000 NYCHA residents and 400,000 other New Yorkers. Um, are we on track with the RFP process and has any money been spent so far, you know, on these, on programs? I know you mentioned it in your, some of your testimony. Um, um, and if so, have we seen a de decrease in the number of NYCHA residents who lack broadband internet? And, and can you give us any numbers on that? Certainly. Thank you, Chair Holden. Um, to the point of uh, the question of when the money will be spent, uh, it will be spent uh, based on the proposals that we received to the RFP. So the capital funds that you mentioned have not yet been spent. Those will be spent in the coming months. Um, we are on track to, uh, to make progress, to, to reach the mayor's stated goals. And um, in terms of NYCHA residents, I, I think you're aware of some of the programs during the pandemic that have been specifically focused on NYCHA residents. Uh, obviously, the, the work that Department of Education has done, getting tablets in the hands of school children, uh, the work that my office did, uh, working to get internet connected tablets and uh, coaching for 10,000 seniors living alone or with other seniors in NYCHA housing uh, and the work that's happened in learning bridges. These third sites, the cornerstones, uh, 75 of them I believe they're located in, um, sorry for the background noise, in NYCHA residences and uh, ensuring that children that are going to these cornerstones uh, have quality Wi-Fi and broadband to support learning. And of course, we all know that if we're doing things like Zoom and Teams and video calls, that takes more bandwidth. So we upgraded the uh, connectivity in these uh, cornerstone um, uh, cornerstones that are currently serving as learning bridges. And it's important to note that even once the learning bridges program ends, once kids are fully back in school, um, those sites will continue to have that upgraded connectivity. So those are some of the things that we've done. When we look at the, uh, uh, the RFEI that we initiated last year, that is leading to tens of thousands of uh, NYCHA residents who are benefiting there. And we expect uh, and will prioritize NYCHA residents as we review the proposals th that we receive to the RFP as well. Right. Um, so, you know, the recently uh, passed state budget mandated uh, providing $15 a, a month internet service for a low income New Yorker. How do we reach that? How do we meet that in New York City? Uh, that's a recent proposal from uh, the state, from the governor. And uh, we certainly are fully on board with uh, low cost, affordable broadband. $15 a month is a great price, uh, one that allows a lot of families and households that today are priced out of the market to participate. Um, we are working through the RFP uh, by, by saying anybody who wants to work with us, who wants to leverage the rooftops and the rooms and the assets that the city controls uh, can come to us and propose affordable rates like, for example, $15 um, uh, a month. Uh, in terms of mandating that in the private sector when there is no uh, negotiation, there is no involvement with the city. Uh, my understanding is that that is not an authority that the city has. Uh, so um, uh, we are really focused on how we can partner with the private sector, with community-based organizations, with nonprofits uh, who want to work with us, who want to use these assets that we can deliver to lower the barrier to entry, to lower their costs of doing business. And in return, they are committing to providing low-cost broadband at prices like the one that you mentioned. 
right. So, you know, you mentioned those 10,000 tablets to NYCHA residents. Um, and then you held um, a training session. I think at the last hearing, there were very few people, 11% or so or less, that actually um, attended those, those, um, those, you know, um, training sessions. Um, have, have you held more training set, uh, sessions since then? Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to follow which, um, the 11% figure, where, where did that come from? That's what, um, is it 11% that, uh, I'm sorry? 7%, sorry. <laughs> That's even, but, but, it, but, you know, there weren't that at the time, this was at the, at the, at our last hearing, you mentioned that, and we were, you know, quite interested that not many people were being trained on it. I just, we just worried about that. If people aren't trained, especially seniors, mm -hmm. you know, because we have we have programs to train seniors in our senior centers, and that hasn't ha happened either with the uh, senior centers being closed. So we're concerned about that people are educated on how to use the uh, the tablets. Sure. Uh, so those numbers don't uh, don't don't um, ring a bell to me. I'd have to go back and check, but we are working actively with DIFTA and we've seen a lot of engagement from the recipients of the tablets with the coaching services that have been provided by OATS, Older Adult Technology Services, a, a nonprofit with expertise in the space. And OATS continues to provide uh, this coaching to uh, a large number of seniors. Uh, I'd have to go back and check and get you those. those well, we, we, just, we just checked, we have an exact number, 789 out of 10,000 people, you know, got actual, uh, instructions on um, on how to use the tablet. That's what we did. We're just concerned that, that it, yeah, we hope I mean, that it continues, the training continues, and it just doesn't fall by the wayside. That's right. Absolutely. And, and agreed on the importance of this training and coaching. Um, I'm just wondering whether that figure is um, specifically about using the tablet as opposed to accessing um, exercise classes, so the variety of, of types of engagements that have occurred between older adults and OATS, um, I think goes beyond the, the figure that you've got in front of you. Yeah, um, again, it's, this is what we were given as how many people attended, but that's, uh, um, yeah, uh, although, although the internet master plan does not set any concrete deadlines, according to page 57, it looks like there is a deadline, like you mentioned, um, it was in June, I think, um, for you know, for the um, the RFPs, or is it in May? Are you referring to 2021 or 2020? 2021. You said um, the RFPs. So you're gonna you're gonna look at the uh, uh, the RFPs in May or June? Because at one point we did get in June of 2021. Is it moved up to May or you gonna? Yeah, you're gonna we'll be in May. The good news is we will be looking at uh, at these proposals in, in May um, and uh, we'll be getting through them as, as quickly as we can and um, moving on the ones that can be implemented most quickly. Uh, so so that'll be May, it might be into June, the, the licensing process will start as soon as possible thereafter and that's all going to, to then lead to uh, uh, organizations putting equipment in place and, and ultimately starting to deliver service later this year. Um, I do want to go back to the, the prior uh, question and make sure that um, it's fully understood that OATS is not the only way in which we are working to deliver digital inclusion work. So there are a variety of programs, uh, millions of dollars a year that, that the city is spending um, to ensure that we are, are doing outreach, working with community groups. You correctly pointed out that it's been a bit of an extra challenge during the pandemic because a lot of the physical convenings uh, are not happening. But we've been working to support agencies and outside groups who have been moving to, to virtual experiences uh, during this time. And frankly, I would expect to see some of these virtual uh, convenings and virtual coaching continue. We're also bringing on some new digital inclusion resources into my office to work specifically in conjunction with the RFP process and the implementation of the Internet Master Plan. Uh, and then finally, on the, on the tablet front, the 10,000 tablets uh, with DIFTA, um, again, I'm happy to go back and look and try to get uh, better numbers for you, uh, but the tablet utilization is nearly 100%. So whether or not people are, are calling OATS and asking how to use the tablet, clearly people are, are using the tablets, whether that's because they already knew how to do it, or maybe a family member coached them, a friend, 
Uh, so, so we're getting the outcomes that we want from the program. Yeah, but it's, it's a little hard to measure though, isn't it? Uh, how effective the tablets are. That's why I think um, some testimonials are important mm -hmm. from, you know, how did the, those, uh, those tablets change their life? Absolutely. You know, I mean, we need to we need to get data on this because just handing somebody a tablet, and I know we've had a little bit of that in, in DOE, obviously. We need to train people, we need to have the proper connections, internet connections, and the proper speeds and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. But we need, if we're gonna lay out a lot of money, and then what well, we were concerned with the lack of training, that it could be um, a lot of wasted, let's say, money if if they're not trained properly and if they're not using it. But you know, how do you measure that somebody's using it? I mean, you just send them a questionnaire. Those those are all fair points. And what we've seen is we have received testimonials that are that are um, you know really touch your heart. Uh, people getting appointments with their cardiologist online so they can stay safe during the pandemic. Uh, people who have described the benefit to their mental health. Uh, people who've gotten groceries delivered uh, by having a tablet. People and and this is actually maybe the most common thing is just connecting with family in a way that's safe. Staying connected to family and peer groups uh, during the pandemic. So we've received those testimonials. In terms of how we've been measuring, we've been looking at the data on, on usage. Um, we have not been uh, pushing too hard on reaching every single one of the 10,000 people because uh, frankly, we, we don't wanna burden them. Uh, there, there, were, there were no strings attached to this program. The, the program is to put tablets in people's hands and then for us to understand, are they being used? Um, so we will continue to assess how they're being used, uh, but we also don't want to burden uh, the people who receive them who, who have a lot going on in their lives, especially during an especially difficult, challenging time. Um, so I'm just going to refer to uh, January 6th. We had a hearing um, in my, my office together with the offices of uh, Council Member Moya and uh, Council Member Amprey Samuel sent you a letter with 11 follow-up questions. And as of this date, we've yet to hear from your office. So um, I want to go over some of those questions, if you, if I, I think. may. Um, and you might have answered some of them, but um, uh, we did have. This is why, you know, we we have these hearings so we can get answers. And uh, so, um, in, in your testimony, then you stated that the city will invest in new infrastructure that can be shared by multiple broadband operators and, and used for a variety of technologies. Um, how much uh, is the investment and what is the new type of infrastructure that, that we're looking at? So it's, it's too early to say what the investment ultimately will be. This is coming from those, those capital funds that we've described previously. Um, but in terms of the technologies, I would, I would refer to the internet master plan, uh, which describes an array of potential technologies. We're not saying that all of these will be proposed or, or all of these will be appropriate in every part of New York City, but really looking at modern approaches to how you provide connectivity uh, in, additional, in addition to the more traditional uh, digging up the streets, putting fiber in the ground. Um, that's still gonna be necessary in places, but we've also got fixed wireless, leveraging rooftops. We know that's going to be um, uh, uh, probably um, a common theme in the proposals that we receive. There are other things too, though. Uh, uh, CBRS, uh, Citizens Broadband uh, Radio Service, Mesh Networks. Um, we're looking at the role that Edge Cloud is going to be playing in, in the rooms and buildings. So to the point of multiple assets, multiple providers using the same physical asset, uh, that's a priority because we're looking to have competition in the service. And so in order to get competitive service, you need to have multiple providers there. And um, uh, that hasn't always been prioritized. Uh, in the past, people have looked for a silver bullet. They've looked for one company that's going to provide one technology that's going to solve the problem everywhere. And that hasn't worked here in New York City, and, and it hasn't worked in other cities where it's been tried either. So that's why we're taking this portfolio approach where we're inviting in as much competition uh, as the market will provide, and we're lowering the barriers to entry to make uh, the cost of coming into these markets, these neighborhoods, um, lower than they've ever been before. And that's the, that's the goal here. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, we'll be able to give you more clarity in the coming months once we have the proposals in hand and we can compare and contrast. Yeah, we also, we asked for a breakdown of the budget for the internet master plan, sort of uh, from the office. So if we can get that also, um, we have a better you know, understanding of what, what we, uh, we can expect. 
I know just back on the um, the wireless, um, at, at least today, the wireless technology that exists uh, has to be line of sight so buildings could get in the way possibly. So is that uh, currently what you understand? So there's line of sight and there's non-line of sight. They, they both exist. Uh, there, there are certainly benefits to having line of sight available. Um, so that's the most straightforward. But uh, there are companies out there that have proposed uh, interesting conversations uh, previously, uh, non-line of sight solutions, and we'll see if those end up being part of uh, the proposals that we receive. All right. Um, so uh, testimony provided at the hearing by Advocates for Children of New York and some news reports have drawn attention to the fact that some families, like I mentioned before about the homeless shelter residents cannot connect to the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, waiting, are we waiting for the RFP? I mean, to, to solve this, um, you know, because it seems kind of, because we might even be into another school year before we can get them connected. So um, are, are you aware of similar issues uh, with signal blockage in NYCHA buildings? Do you know about any of that? Because we're, that's what we're hearing. In terms of whether we're waiting to solve these urgent problems, uh, the answer is no, we're not. Uh, we're right. taking action to, to make sure that kids can learn, um, to make sure that the people who are most vulnerable in the community, most in need of connectivity, uh, get it. So it's a multi-pronged approach. It's looking at what are the things that we have to do now because there is uh, an emergency. There's a, there's a pandemic. There's an impact on, again, education, on, on people being able uh, to safely get the services they need. Um, but we're also looking at how do we transform the market? Because if we only do the emergency actions, putting tablets in people's hands, uh, subsidizing service, that doesn't transform the market. And that ends up uh, meaning that people continue to be priced out. And the only way to solve that problem is uh, the city using tax dollars inevitably or, or indeterminately, forever and ever. And instead, uh, we believe the smarter way to transform the market is this uh, uh, approach that we're taking, it's focused on competition and focused on partnership and the role that the city can play to lower those barriers to entry, drive more companies in the market, bring down prices. Um, but to, I think, the core of your question, we are not viewing that as the only thing that the city needs to do. We recognize the urgency, uh, and that's why we've taken uh, the number of approaches uh, uh, that we've been, we've been talking about in the past 12 months or so. Okay, um, another thing on the January hearing, you mentioned that the uh, Internet of Things, the IoT Task Force mm -hmm. Working Group, uh, at the time you, you were not ready to answer questions about the group. Um, do you have an update, uh, you know, inform us of the group's goals, um, who is in the group even, or has the group uh, met yet, and, and what was discussed? Uh, sure, so we're very happy that the Internet of Things strategy was released um, earlier this spring. So that is out and, uh, and we've been working both with agencies as well as uh, organizations out, out there in society who are focused on this issue uh, and focused on ensuring that in New York City, IoT is, is productive, it's fair, we've got a healthy ecosystem, we've got a thriving startup community and tech sector that can employ people, uh, but also these, these tools can be used to benefit New Yorkers, things like flood monitoring, things like pedestrian counting, in ways that respect people's privacy and, and digital rights. So uh, we're happy that that's out. In terms of the, um, the working group, there is a Smart Cities Collaborative that is being um, uh, put together as we speak. I've been involved, uh, our director of Smart Cities and IoT, Paul Rothman, uh, has, been, has been driving this work. And we've invited, um, uh, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but, but happy to get it to you. Um, we've invited probably a dozen plus, maybe, maybe 20 uh, different agencies that are doing work or might be doing work, could benefit from Internet of Things technologies. Uh, these are folks like the Department of Transportation, folks uh, like the Department of Buildings, uh, NYC Cyber Command. Again, it's a it's a pretty full list, and uh, and that those those convenings will be happening um, throughout this year. Uh, the Smart Cities Collaborative specifically has not yet met, uh, but we'll be meeting in the next couple of months. And um, uh, the working group that existed before that uh, helped inform the strategy itself, uh, and so that's uh, essentially a a growth of the stakeholder group is what's going on right now. The Smart Cities Collaborative. They're still meeting, they're still meeting. The, yes, there's there's nothing that would prevent them from meeting. I don't know when they most recently met. Yeah, so, can you get back to us on that? Because we'd like to see how many meetings 
you know, what was discussed, you know, throw some light on this. So it's not just sure. the behind the scenes get togethers um, yeah. or Zoom, Zoom meetings. And, you know, we'd like to see, you know, there's progress. And um, so the, but the internet master plan sites are 29% of the households do not have a broadband subscription at home. Um, if this is true, why do we have this situation? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it is 29%. Do you, do you have some causes for that? Yeah. Um, a lot of people talk about lack of access and what you really end up realizing is access is, is a primary issue in rural areas. In urban areas, there are still access issues in, in very uh, specific parts of, of cities like ours, but it really is an affordability issue. That is the core crisis is affordability. And the relatively few companies that uh, uh, provide the options, and again, somebody might live in a place where they only have two options. Um, and so those prices stay high and they never come down. As productivity improves, you would expect the prices would come down, but there's no market pressure for that to happen. And so a bunch of people are just priced out of the market and uh, it just doesn't make sense for them. And you look at what has existed as a solution. The federal government has had the lifeline program, which is a subsidy, but the challenge there is that that can only be used on once per household, not every person, and it can only be used for home broadband or mobile. So many folks choose to use that subsidy if they know about it for mobile, which means that they can't use it for home and the other members of their family can't use it for mobile either. So it just, the, the, the solution set that has existed until now simply has not been sufficient to close this, this gap and close this digital divide. Um, you also look at the fact that one of the reasons prices actually are higher in the neighborhoods that need low prices the most, these are the lowest income neighborhoods, the ones that are too often uh, majority minority neighborhoods that are being affected here. It's because historically there's been an underinvestment in the broadband infrastructure, the fiber, the conduit, the, the backbone, the stuff that people need uh, to cheaply provide the service uh, just doesn't exist in a lot of, a lot of the neighborhoods that need it most. And so you've got the neighborhoods that can afford higher prices actually have a lower cost of delivery because the infrastructure is already there. The neighborhoods that can't afford it, there's a really big barrier to entry uh, to someone coming in. And that's what we're looking to address with the open access neutral host um, uh, broadband infrastructure that the city will own uh, through this substantial historic investment that the instrument master plan uh, is, is doing. Um, and then we'll be managing that with an asset manager who makes that broadly available to any company, large or small. So the cost of doing business in say, East New York or Brownsville will come down dramatically uh, when that open access neutral host network is available. Yeah, so you know, looking at the causes, do you think that uh, exclusive agreements by internet providers in buildings contribute to a lack of coverage? Uh, I like to see competition. So right. I think exclusive agreements, even though a lot of uh, buildings might, might think, hey, we're getting a good deal, this makes sense, uh, over the long run ends up keeping prices higher for everybody. And so I, I would prefer to see uh, uh, competition over exclusivity. Right, because the map, you know, you, you look at most of the map of coverage in New York City and the internet providers, service providers, most of the city really only has a, a few choices. That's right. Which is, you know, hopefully we can solve this. Uh, because that's why we pay such high prices in New York City. And you're right, the, the neighborhoods that can afford it have more of a choice, which that's it's just, it's, like you said, it should be reversed. So um, the internet master plan states that uh, fiber optic infrastructure is relatively sparse throughout the rest of the city outside of lower Manhattan, which we were just talking about, you know, and again, we have to look at the root causes so we just don't keep doing the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again. Um, so, you know, that's why uh, this group that is meeting, we need to really find out how do we, we don't fall into the same traps that Absolutely. some of these internet providers are just going to keep doing the same thing and, and, and um, uh, affecting the rest, of, and especially the people who can't afford it, give them less choices and less service and slower speeds and so forth and so yeah. forth. So, and I, I just um, want to add to what you said there about um, fiber availability. So commercial fiber is, um, uh, you know, is necessary for, for competitive options for small businesses all around the city too. We spend a lot of time talking about home broadband, critical, but also 
we need to make sure we're supporting our small businesses because in this day and age, they've got to be able to get online and serve people digitally uh, if they want to compete. And if we want to keep jobs and small businesses in the boroughs where they've been, where they've grown up and flourished uh, and not force them to move to lower Manhattan or a place that's got uh, a more density of, uh, of fiber options, we've got to make sure that that's uh, another constituency that we're thinking about and uh, ensuring is served. So is this back to the IOT working group? Um, what type of public outreach um, will your office do uh, on, on uh, you know, because we, we really want to, we want to educate people obviously as to what's going on and how, you know, what kind of um, things can they expect, uh, an improvement can they expect in their service? So is there outreach in, in, from your office on that? So I, I think there's a bit of a difference here between the IoT working group versus um, broadband service. So yes, IoT will benefit from better broadband service, but the outreach that the, uh, that the, the IoT work is um, incorporating is, uh, is separate from the RFP and, and the investments that are being made by the city here with the interim master plan. So um, I think I'd have to go back and, and check with my team to see what the specific plan is. I'm happy to get back to you with that. Uh, if I could take a moment to go back to the question around the 10,000 tablets for older adults and um, the training that OATS in particular has provided, I got a note from my team with some specific numbers that I just want to make sure I share with you. Uh, OATS has delivered virtual training to uh, 9,709 participants. Now that is non-unique, so somebody might have received training multiple times. Uh, but clearly that's much higher than uh, seven or 11% of uh, their participants. And um, um, how did they do this in, in during the pandemic? That's a, it's a little curious. Yeah. Oh, they, they, they well, do it? So virtually. So a lot of phone calls, they actually received and handled over 58,000 phone calls for this program. Um, so that's support calls in and out. And uh, those sessions lasted as long as 121 minutes. So these were not just 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Some of these were very hands-on, really helping someone achieve what they wanted and learn something new. So, uh, so when we look at the effectiveness of that program, uh, and you asked earlier about how, how do we assess that, how do we judge that, these are the types of metrics that we're, we're tracking uh, to understand um, the breadth of the benefit. So let me just ask you a general question. Do you support municipal network a, uh, a network built by New York City rather think, than private companies? So my, my take is that all options should be on the table. And when you look at the internet master plan, it, it specifically did not rule anything out. And I think that's the right approach. We're going to get proposals in the next couple of weeks. And that is going to tell us a lot. Um, we've seen from the, uh, the level of interest in the NYCHA RFEI, which only put on the table assets controlled by one particular authority of New York City, not uh, over a dozen, and didn't have any capital investment associated with it. We saw substantial dozens of different companies came to the table there. We're going to find out uh, what level of interest and, and how deeply serious uh, even the, the large incumbents are about working with us in this new way uh, through the RFP. Uh, and once we, we see that level of interest, I think that's going to help us understand how much it makes sense, uh, might make sense uh, to continue um, iterating on this path of partnership and engagement uh, uh, or consider other options. Okay, you mentioned, you kind of touched on this before, but on internet access, where in the city do we have the biggest gaps, like specific neighborhoods? Uh, so in terms of boroughs, it's the Bronx. Um, the Bronx has the lowest uh, rates of internet adoption. When you look neighborhood by neighborhood, you see the, the lowest rates in the city are places like uh, Lower East Side, I know is somewhere in the 40s, I believe. I think it's something like 46, 48% uh, adoption. Um, when you look at the wealthiest parts of the city, you're looking at 90 something percent. I mentioned during my testimony that the city and this administration have run a number of uh, pilot programs to, to more deeply understand uh, this challenge and understand what really works as a solution. And one of the things that we did was we worked in Queensbridge Houses, largest public housing uh, project in North America, and uh, worked to deliver free public Wi-Fi to all the residents there. And the adoption we saw go from around 50% to over 90%. So 
So we saw the adoption when, when price was taken out as an issue, we saw the adoption change from what it looked like in a lot of the other uh, lowest income neighborhoods in the city uh, to rival the highest income neighborhoods in the city. And that really proved that the argument that some of these large companies have been making for years that, well, you know, lower income folks, they just don't want it. They just, they don't know how to use it. They can't benefit from it the same way. Those arguments uh, were proven wrong. Uh, and so what we're looking to do now is, is work in the rest of the neighborhoods of the city that currently have those, those lower adoption rates. And through this RFP process, through implementation of these proposals, uh, make sure they've got uh, low income, or sorry, low cost options available so that we can boost up those adoption rates. Yeah. So, so on affordability, is uh, your, the CTO looking at bulk purchases, you know, bundling uh, a number of purchases like... Uh, they're always trying to sell us uh, with the, these inter internet service providers. Are you looking at a bulk purchase um, for the city, for city users? Well, so we look at bulk purchasing as, uh, as promising for community groups, thinking about how a community can gather its power uh, to do that bulk purchasing. Uh, there might be opportunities there. In terms of the city doing the purchasing itself, um, the challenge there is that then you're looking at using taxpayer dollars in a way that uh, the companies that have suggested that in the past, uh, frankly, see as, as never ending. And so we would prefer to get solutions that are, are really just a, hit, a low cost is provided directly from the company to the, the subscriber. That's the cleanest, simplest, most sustainable way to do this. Um, if that does not happen, then, then I would just say we, we, again, leave every option on the table. Um, all right, uh, uh, Irene, uh, do we have uh, any questions from my colleagues? I can go on, but you're muted. Okay. I apologize. I was on mute. Okay. As of right now, I do not see any questions from council members. And I just want to remind council members, if you would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I do not see any questions right now. Any questions from council members? Okay, um, I'll just go and continue. <laughs> uh, so when my colleagues, they just have to do the raise hand function, but um, did your office work with, um, with Do It or you asked by Do It to work on the vaccine uh, site? Um, you know, for the city, because uh, obviously the major problems that they had ongoing and some of them still ongoing. So was, were, uh, you, were you asked? We were not asked and we have not worked on that particular project. Um, obviously it's a very important project. We all want to see that succeed. We also recognize uh, that um, uh, there are resources around the city, around the administration, and we need to be able to divide and conquer and, uh, and uh, ensure that all of the projects of the city are successful. Okay. Uh, so according uh, to the report, uh, your office will develop a uniform contract language based on recommended policies and standards to be used as a template for future Wi-Fi development. Um, was that done? Uh, can you clarify where that language is coming from? The internet report, the, um, what was that? The master plan, yeah. That's in the master plan? Yeah. Um, We have developed license. We've developed a, a standard language for licensing agreements. Uh, uh, for example, those uh, following on the RFI. That language will be used uh, again with uh, partners that we work with um, through the RFP. So I believe that that is what you're referring to in the language that was in the interim master plan is referring to those standards that have been created and are in practice now through the RFBI uh, work and will be used again in the RFP work. Yeah, I was just wondering if we can get a copy of the template to see what, how you're, yeah. you're I, 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 I believe so. I will, I will check with my team. I don't think there's any reason that, that we wouldn't be able to provide that. Okay, during, the, and I'll ask a few more questions. I, you know, I think uh, hopefully uh, some of my colleagues might have a question, but during the briefing with our committee on public Wi-Fi last summer, your colleague, uh, I think former deputy uh, Joshua Breitbart, 
mentioned that your office would be working with Cyber Command to issue updated cybersecurity protocols applicable for public Wi-Fi. Um, what is the pro uh, progress on drafting these protocols? That is a, a very good question. We've got a great working relationship with NYC Cyber Command. The city is fortunate to have um, such terrific expertise on the cybersecurity front. I, uh, I'll need to check with them and see where we stand, what's been completed, and, and to the extent there's more work to do where that stands. We'll take that as, a, as an item to get back to you on. Okay. Um, I think that's... Uh... Uh, do we have any questions from my colleagues? We'll go back again. No, I do not see any council members wishing to ask any questions. Do you have any more questions to the administration chair? Um, I think we went over things. I think we, uh, we, we covered most of the areas that I wanted to cover, but um, if my colleagues have anything, I just want to, you know, the link, uh, um, how do you, do you consider the link NYC kiosk successful? Uh, so that's a good question. And as you know, the link NYC kiosks uh, uh, started before my time. And that's also administered by do it. So I think do it would be in a better position uh, than than me to discuss uh, what has worked well with uh, with link. But but again, do you have you don't have an opinion on it? Well, I mean, when I look at and we can go back to the Internet Master Plan and how it views the world, we need connectivity in public spaces. So home and mobile is critical, but we also need to think about connectivity in public spaces. And so one of the things that Link NYC uh, attempts to do is, is to provide that. Now we know that we don't have the coverage um, that was originally planned. And that means that there are public spaces in the city where we know we wanna have coverage and connectivity and, and it doesn't exist. So, uh, so in that regard, I think the goal and intent is uh, laudable and something that we need to continue to focus on. Uh, in terms of the execution, I, I do want to defer to my colleagues who actually manage that program. Okay. All right. So uh, just a couple more questions. I think in your testimony, uh, pre previous testimony, you mentioned that most ISPs collect data on their customers. We know that. Um, such data can include IP addresses, browsing histories, and other sensitive information. Is data collection a factor that you consider when you review proposals for uh, ISPs? That's an excellent question, uh, right on the nose. And the five principles that the Internet Master Plan lays out on, on literally the first page, um, one of those is privacy. And um, we need to make sure that companies are respecting the privacy of their users, their subscribers, that the data that's being collected is being collected with a purpose to provide a better service. Because many times there's a real reason for a company to want to have certain type of data. What we don't want to see is companies just gobbling up data uh, for no good reason or just to have the data because they might come up with a reason to use it later. And we certainly don't want to see them gobbling up data and then selling it through data brokers uh, and this kind of gray market that's currently out there. Uh, so privacy is one of those five principles and we are going to be assessing the proposals against those five principles and that's baked into how the review committee is going to operate. But again, how do you monitor that? Once you, let's say they sign contracts, how do you monitor that, that they're not taking this data and you, because we've, we've caught companies doing this all the time. So how do we monitor that they're abiding by the contract? Well, there are, there are, uh, Organizations here in the city, but also maybe state and federal that would be interested in this issue. You look at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, uh, making sure that companies are treating consumers uh, fairly, that they're they're actually doing what they say they're gonna do. Um, and obviously at the state mm -hmm. and federal level, you've got organizations that care about the same issues. Uh, we wanna work with the, the organizations that have the resources uh, to follow up, to do inspections, to to ensure that they you know audit, whatever, whatever the approach um, that, that makes sense. Uh, we want to work with them to ensure that they understand what uh, these companies have agreed to with us and, um, and to ensure that that's, that's actually so what Does your, your office have any standards for privacy? Um, again, what, what, is, what are some of the standards that you, you want them to meet? Other than just not you know, using private information, but um, again, how far can they go? I mean, we need to know parameters right. here. 
Well, so uh, we've got the attorney general who's working on this issue. We know we've got the mayor's office of apologies again for the sirens. We've got the uh, mayor's office of information privacy uh, led by the chief privacy officer. So we've got a variety of colleagues again here in the city, but also uh, state and federal level who are, are working on this day in and day out. Um, we have not as an office viewed this as an issue for, for us to uh, take the individual lead on, but instead to work with the experts that we have access to. And I guess I would say the, the, RF, the city has standards. So this is going back to the, the chief privacy officer and the work that uh, Lauren Agron and her team do. Uh, so the city has standards, we lean into those and we incorporate those into things like the RFP. Uh, so we're not developing standalone different standards where we're working with uh, with what exists. Okay, so we it's got to be a little clearer though, I think. Uh, all right, um, so just uh, my, I think my last question, I'm thinking this might be it. Um, and the following question was asked several times. However, we are still waiting for the answer. February 25th, 2020, October 30th, 2020. In May, 2019, your office issued a report called Truth in Broadband, Public mm -hmm. Wi-Fi in New York City. According to this report, the CTO's office would collect relevant agreements, GIF agreements between the city and Wi-Fi providers for free public Wi-Fi systems uh, and post them on the website. It's on, it's on 20, page 22 of the report. Are these agreements collected uh, and posted? Um, I will need to check on that and see where uh, they are posted and where, um, to the extent that we can get that information um, to you so you can just see it yourself, uh, we'll, we'll get that to you. Uh, as you mentioned, this was May of 2019, it was just before I joined the office. So I agree that we should be following through on any commitments that were made. Um, but that is something that, that preceded me, uh, and I have to check with my team to get some more details on uh, what came out of it. Chair Holden, I think you're muted. Uh, we just sent a letter um, to your office asking, um, uh, a recent letter, asking a number of, uh, of questions, and hopefully we can get a response within a, a timely, within a, a, few, a few weeks even. Um, because many of them, like, like I said, we, we never receive a response. So just that okay. if you can answer in a timely fashion, I won't go over the letter, but um, you should have it in your office. So if we can get some of those answers and some of the uh, questions today that weren't answered, if you can get back to us. Certainly, that makes sense. Thank, and Thank you so will, much. Thank you. I was gonna say one thing that I think you were asking about privacy and, and uh, it sounded like uh, you want a little bit more information than I'd provided. And one thing I hadn't mentioned that I should have is the legislation that the, the mayor uh, proposed that council member Ku uh, introduced, I believe it's still uh, in front of the council, uh, on privacy that um, focuses on internet privacy, I think probably very relevant to the question that you were asking, uh, and that might be a good place uh, for us to continue the conversation. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back. Thank you again for your testimony. Um, and um, again, we'll, let's work together and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some good news in, in the next few months about uh, you know, you know, bridging the digital divide in New York City finally. So thanks so much, John Paul Farmer. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden, for having me. It's an important issue and uh, we're looking forward to working with you to continue to make progress. Okay, back to committee council. Thank you, um, Mr. Farmer. I do not see any questions from other council members and we will now turn on public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearing, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. And once your name is called, a, num a, number, a member I'm sorry, of our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arm will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. We will ask to, to limit your testimony to five minutes and council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each panelist has completed testimony. I would like now to welcome our first panelist to testify. We will be hearing testimonies today from Clayton Banks, from Caroline, Caroline McGee, and Greta Byron. Mr. Banks. Thank you very much. And thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay, good. So I just would like to say, first of all, good afternoon. And, and certainly Chair Holman and members of the Committee on Technology, this is a very important subject. Uh, I'm Clayton Banks, CEO of Silicon Harlem. And uh, this is just a, an, an honor to be able to testify uh, today. I wanted to clearly start off with, I love the internet master plan. I think it's extraordinary uh, and very proud that from the beginning of the internet master plan, uh, it had inclusion built right in. We here in Harlem actually were presented the internet master plan in January 23rd, 2020. Uh, right before the pandemic. So, you know, literally Harlem was at the table. And I have to say that doesn't always happen um, when it comes to new initiatives in this city. We sometimes get the information much later, uh, but we were at the beginning of this internet master plan. So I just want to start with that. That doesn't mean, you know, as a New Yorker, I don't have some criticisms, but I do believe the internet master plan is transformative, especially for those New Yorkers who've had been mitigated or left behind on the on the digital divide. And I, I have changed my language, uh, Chair, from digital divide to digital inequality. That's what's really happening here. And I think the city council ought to take that on because that's a very big issue here in our in our particular city. The two things I just wanted to testify around is one, I think the internet master plan should be a living document. It should not be stopped here. It should not just have been like, hey, we built it, this is it. I think um, the, the master plan should be something that will grow over time because things change so much in technology. And so I'm, I'm pleading to the council to keep that document alive. And I know that uh, the CTO's office uh, would embrace that. So I'm, I'm really hoping that's something that we could all um, you know, work with. The, the other part of that is when you keep it alive like that, you start to understand that there's more to it than just, um, you know, the RFP. There's a whole lot of areas that we're looking at in the future. We talked about 2040 or 2045. We are looking at a city that's going to transform infrastructure wise as well as connectivity and all of those things that come with it that can create additional inequities. So it's important to keep this extremely alive so that we don't continue to repeat, as John Paul Farmer mentioned, uh, the same issues that we've had in the past. I will try to uh, conclude with this a couple of uh, suggestions. So one of them would be, we talked about in the internet master plan about applications. Uh, some of the new applications that will come from this uh, better infrastructure, better speeds, you know, low latencies, all these things are coming with this infrastructure. The question becomes when we talk about the ushering of new applications and, and things of that nature that will run on these networks, is it inclusive? That's an important piece because there's a lot of people in upper Manhattan that are um, falling behind a little bit in STEM education and all these type of things to be the makers of some of these applications. So we wanna make sure that we're spreading this out across the entire footprint of our city. Uh, that all populations are getting access to developing applications that run on these networks. And lastly, uh, and I have a whole lot that I'm going to submit as testimony, but I know I'm limited in time. But I see the last piece for me is that even though there's going to be um, all of this, all of these submissions, I think one of the internet master plans, uh, things that could grow also is just creating some standards. We heard about Queens, Queensbridge on this call. Well, one of the issues that Queensbridge had was there wasn't enough uh, standards on pulling conduit or pulling fiber. So what happened, some of the material wasn't strong enough to keep what? Rats from eating right through it. So we have to be careful in, in what we deploy and making sure that we are, uh, and I hate to be you know talking about rats, Chair Holden, but I had to say it. And so at the end of the day, we ought to think about standards on fiber, on conduit, and some other things uh, that we have infrastructure that serves everybody properly. Thank you again for this, and uh, happy to uh, continue to have these discussions. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, Irene, did you unmute yourself? I apologize. 
Mr. Banks, I just want to thank you, and I want to turn back to Chair Holden for any questions that he might have. Thank you, Clayton, and thank you for all you do for New York City. And uh, uh, I'm glad you like uh, the proposal, uh, the Internet Master Plan. Um, if it delivers everything they say they're going to deliver, that'd be wonderful. But um, I, I do appreciate that you said it's a living document. It's, it should be, and that's very, very appropriate. And John Paul Farmer is listening to this. So that's the good thing about his office. Uh, he stays on the call, uh, he stays on the hearings, and he listens to every hearing, all the advocates, and uh, that's, that's, the, that's what I, I recognize about him. That means he cares. Um, we've seen most of uh, the city agencies don't stay on, his does. So uh, he likes to, you know, he listens to people. So um, in, in your area, how many internet service providers do you have to choose from? It really is a duopoly. You know, it's a Verizon and Spectrum, and even both of those don't go everywhere. So um, it keeps the price high in a lot of ways. We, we appreciate the fact that they're um, providers, but I do think the Internet Master Plan will help even those um, big, big companies realize that this is no longer um, uh, to be leaving people behind. It's just impossible, right? It's just not even an issue anymore. You have to have broadband. So I'm hoping, and I do talk with a lot of the incumbents and the, and the providers in our community, I talk to them about thinking about new ways of delivering broadband that they can bring the price dramatically down without all of the subsidies and games that go on with this stuff, where when we talk about $15 that I heard on this call, you got to also ask, what does come with the $15? Do they get the kind of speed that I get in my household? You know, the, that, that, those are the other things you have to consider when you talk about these subsidies. So I think it's important for us to bring in competition, but also work with these guys and say, hey, listen, this, you know, why do you have to bundle it up? Well, you know, why don't you make a broadband only play? There's all types of things that a lot of people can do. Also, truth in advertising. Are, are they delivering the speeds they say they're going to deliver? And that's when I, I think we're not checking that because we've done tests in our office even, and we're not getting what we're paying for. And I think many households are not getting it. In fact, I was on a call with uh, teachers from uh, in my district who all said that they were having problems with speed and freezing uh, obviously screens with the students, but even within the school itself, uh, it wasn't just uh, the students at home, it was in the, in the school itself, they were having issues. So that's what we need to, to um, you know, the devil's in the details here. So we need to, if we're getting these speeds, uh, they say we're getting it, and there's only two companies, uh, you know, involved in the neighborhood. That's not good. It's never a good recipe. So, uh, thank you, Clayton. Thanks again, and uh, uh, I'll turn it back over to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Banks, again. And now I will be calling on Ms. McGee to testify. Yes, Hello. Yeah. Hello, my name is Caroline McGee, and I'm on the legal team at the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, also known as STOP. Before I begin, I did want to take a moment to thank Chair Holden and the other council members on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. On to the reason I'm here, the Internet Master Plan is an ambitious, forward-thinking commitment that I and many other New Yorkers appreciate from the city. However, it does fail on privacy protections for the New Yorkers it purports to help. The plan itself claims privacy is one of the principles of the entire project, but that claim rings hollow compared to the actual programming offered. The city's plan points to consumer education through Library Privacy Week and the training of library staff to answer questions as among their solutions, but consumer education is the false flag of internet security because it is often paraded as a solution to insecurity when it is actually a solution to liability, and to do it right requires enormous resource investment by the city. A potential example of a more useful piece of consumer education than what the city is talking about would be a specific guide about the data collection potentially taking place, with the names of every private entity involved at every level included. Importantly, this guide could not be in so-called legalese, and it would need to be in multiple languages. Even with real, accessible, meaningful consumer education, that would not be enough. New Yorkers also need legislative protection, only available from the people on this council, it is the reality of the country we live in that any data collected by an entity is just waiting to be tapped by law enforcement. And it is an inevitability, not a possibility, that any kind of public broadband will result in some data collection. 
This trove of data will only serve to further put New Yorkers of color and undocumented members of the community at risk of police overreach and abuse. Legislation could address this and make it so that the NYPD and other law enforcement bodies must obtain a warrant for the information from internet providers. The information collected about us on the internet is some of the most intimate and New Yorkers need novel legislation that will prevent government access to the data collected on them. This will prevent some of the more egregious harms practically guaranteed to occur when private actors are permitted to collect this information. More egregious yet is how the city also promises that it has improved its internal governance in recent years by creating the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy. This office publishes quarterly reports on data breaches from within the city government. And while that's important, it is equally important to put it into perspective. This is the absolute least the city could do. These reports are just an admission of data already misplaced. It's not a bad thing, but to consider privacy taken care of because this office exists would be a bad mistake. My final criticism comes from 10,000 feet up. This plan frames privacy as a race against elite black hat hackers who type quickly on bright screened computers and dimly lit rooms. And that's not what privacy is. Privacy has to be from everyone, including law enforcement. And until the city acknowledges that and takes the appropriate steps to honor the commitment that they have made in this plan with meaningful privacy protections, New Yorkers will remain in danger of having their privacy breached at the expense of internet access. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Chair Holden, do you have any questions to the panelist? Well, thank you, Caroline. And uh, um, we don't even know, and I think you, you're probably a, uh, more of an expert than I am on this, but we don't even know what who's sharing our information, what companies, we, we're so blind on this. And I don't know if, it, you know, if technology is always one step ahead of us, even with legislation. So if you have any ideas on legislation, I'd, I'd like to communicate with you on this because I, we, we do, if we can prevent the invasion of privacy every time we um, log on to a site, obviously that we need to, we need to try to, um, to um, obviously, you know, legislate. Um, should, should there, you know, be New York City digital privacy laws that, you know, that we have, or do we have some now at all um, that, you, that you agree with? I don't think there's ne nearly enough at this point. Um, I think a, sort of a prime example of somewhere where that's where the ball's been dropped on that is the user policy for the Link NYC kiosks, which I heard you ask about earlier, um, Chair. I the user policy is sort of inscrutable and people don't know what they're signing off and they have to use the Wi-Fi. They need it as everyone in this meeting has acknowledged inter the internet is a necessity. Um, and there's nothing protecting New Yorkers from Link NYC. When you are, um, you know, what is that saying? If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Um, and I, I really worry about that for New Yorkers. Uh, my organization would love to be in further contact with you about legislation on, to that effect. Yes, because I'd like to, let's have a meeting soon on this because we do, um, we do care about this and we all have been violated, I think at one time or another, somehow um, by these, uh, they're selling our information and we know that. And every time we use even uh, a credit card, they have information on us. Uh, they know what we bought. They know where we bought this. They, they know what we tend to buy and, and, and how it's being sold and how much money they're making. But th there, this is a, a, an issue that, again, with um, uh, working with John Paul Farmer's uh, office, the CTO's office and do it, maybe we can prevent a lot of it. We, I don't know if we'll prevent all of it, but we need to have, this has to be a big conversation, a big part of the internet master plan. And I thank you for bringing this up, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden. And thank you, Ms. McGee, for your testimony. Our next panelist will be Greta Byram. Ms. Good Byram. Time again. Hi, um, good afternoon. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really happy to share my thoughts on how New York City's agencies and departments, as well as the city council, can take measures right now in order to achieve the full benefits and stated goals of the Internet Master Plan. That is to create quality, affordable internet service for all New Yorkers. I'd like to start by restating the broadband principles articulated by the city. Equity, 
performance, affordability, privacy, and choice. Based on my experience listening to New Yorkers as a researcher and a consultant in the development of the master plan, I believe it's critical right now to lay the groundwork to ensure that plan implementation reaches its goals in alignment with these principles. In particular, I believe we're at a critical juncture to set the stage for phase four of the plan, ensuring that all New Yorkers benefit from connectivity. What I mean is that we need an explicit strategy to ensure that infrastructure built with the city's capital funds is designed to serve those principles and goals. This is, the stated goals of the plan are laudable and the plan clearly lays out a strategy for solving the problem, which has not in the past two decades been solved by the city's incumbent internet service providers. In particular, well, in, without sufficient guide rails on implementation and a process dedicated to um, ensuring that the infrastructure follows the principles, we won't achieve that goal. In particular, I believe that the scoring criteria for prospective vendors in the current USB or RFP, as we've been referring to it, may not sufficiently prioritize community engagement and support. Further, I believe that the process around development and release of the, of the universal service, the universal broadband solicitation has lacked sufficient engagement and communication with key digital equity and justice leaders. Without this engagement, there's a lack of knowledge and understanding about the plan and any programming and digital support efforts, which could enable the groundwork for phases three and four. To address these shortcomings, as well as delays in the planned implementation, I believe it's critical right now for the city to one, ensure the development of an evaluation framework based in the broadband principles to guide master plan implementation through all four phases of the plan. And number two, ensure the allocation of sufficient programmatic funds, not just capital funds, um, unlimited by the restrictions placed on capital funds uh, to support the key organizations which will provide their communities with engagement support and critical information around digital equity. We know from experience that incumbent driven subsidy programs for low cost service cannot on their own solve this problem. We've tried that approach for far too long. Indeed, if you build it, they may not come, especially if people don't know about it or if service is too expensive, it's substandard or it includes fatal flaws such as data caps, throttling, slow speeds, limits on types of uses, that is blocking particular uses, eligibility barriers, or time limits on low cost service options, along with escalating costs. The incumbents will argue that to in invest in underlying infrastructure would create an overbuild of that infrastructure. But actually we need that underlying infrastructure in order to ensure that we get to full implementation of phase four. New York City has made the choice not to depend solely on subsidy programs, which all too often become shaped by spe special interests, but rather to build according to the broadband principles. Let's not waste this opportunity to make progress towards not just digital equity, but full equity for all New Yorkers. Let's put good money after good by fully resourcing and guiding public and community efforts to close the digital divide in line with the city's stated goals. Thank you, Ms. Byram. Councilmember Holden, do you have any question to the questions to this panelist? Um, thank you, Greta, for your uh, testimony. Uh, do you, I mean, um, we have to worry about certain things with these companies. Like you mentioned, you kind of touched on a little bit of this, that, that if, what if we if we put on too many restrictions uh, for, for companies, they'll just not participate in New York City. Do you worry about that at all? That we then we will have what you've been saying, what you what you just said is we'll have less of an investment in certain neighborhoods because we've seen that already. Um, I believe that if we 
um, formally and explicitly guide our investments according to the principles, um, what we would be doing is creating better quality of service and that there are plenty of smaller ISPs which are entering the market, which could easily um, offer better service than what the incumbents are so, offering. So we might, be, we might scare off the bigger guys, but we'll still have um, good service. And that's what we're hoping for, right? That's what we're hoping for. Okay, so that, that would, you know, because we hear that argument that if you put too many restrictions, there's people, you put too many restrictions, you, you scare away the, any competition and then we're, we're stuck with uh, what we have now, one or two providers in most of the districts that need it most need coverage and don't get it so um, and i think i think that's a slippery slope because i think that once you start uh shaping your service offerings um to fit special interests you um it's a, just a slippery slope and you start to see things like um, limitations on particular kinds of uses for example limiting bandwidth so that um, students may not have enough um, capacity to attend Zoom online or Zoom-based school. Correct. Thank you. Uh, great, good point. So yes, I'd like to work with your, you know, your office also because there's a, a lot of great ideas out there, and we appreciate, you know, the feedback because this is a, you know, the Internet Master Plan is critical for New York City's future, and, and most of you and, and Clayton said it uh, also, um, and. Uh, it's very important that we get this right, but it, that it is a living document that, that Clayton said before. So we, I thank you for your testimony. Okay, back. Thank back. you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Chair Holden. And I want to thank all of you again for your testimonies. And if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please raise your Zoom hand function now. And I do not see anyone asking to testify or asking any questions. And now I will turn over to Chair Holden again for any closing remarks and to, to adjourn the hearing. Thank you, Irene, and thank you all. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the ideas we got today and uh, certainly the ideas we'll get tomorrow um, will hopefully and, uh, make, it, make it a much, much better city. And um, what we're seeing, the problems now, and I've had problems for a long time with providers. I had three different providers in my house alone and um, wasn't really happy with any of them because we were promised this and got that. Uh, and again, there are, there are many problems in the city that hopefully we can try to address. And I think the, the fact that John Paul Farmer mentioned a lot of them today and, and the internet master plan is, is, a, is a good document. And um, what we're just trying to do is learn more about it, try to improve it and that's why we need the advocates. That's why we need um, all of you that testified today uh, to continue to testify and continue to bring up issues. And we'll try to provide more information, but we have a good start um, with today's hearing. We'll do more hearings on this, uh, obviously, in the future as we um, get the RFPs in and get proposals. But it needs to be tweaked and it needs to be, uh, we need oversight on it. And we need all the feedback from the community. And, um, in, in the past, that hasn't happened. We all know it. The companies just walked right in, did what they wanted, and we were at their mercy. So now hopefully with the new technology, obviously, um, startups coming up, uh, and what Greta mentioned that we're going to get smaller companies coming, and that might be terrific. Um, and certainly we'll have more control as uh, our private inf information is, is not somewhere in the hands of, of companies that just see the bottom line as, as service. So thank you so much. And uh, I wanna thank uh, our committee counsel, Irene Bohofsky for, and, and, and Charles Kim for, for their wonderful work on this. And thank you again, John Paul Farmer for staying the length of the hearing, appreciate it. This, this hearing.